Welcome everybody to Tonight in STEM. I'm your host, Juan Spela. Welcome to another episode, next episode, episode number two of Tonight in STEM, the show where we interview professionals in the field of, well, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Today, I have a very special guest, Max Ramirez. Max, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. A little tired, but I'm good. <laughs> hey, it's been a long day for you, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Okay. Well, before I get started to interview Max and get to know him a little bit about his whole STEM uh, career, um, I want to answer a few questions that a lot of people haven't been asking me. Um, the very first question has been, why are you doing tonight in STEM? What's the purpose of this show? Uh, the purpose of this show is to well, interview professionals in the field of STEM. I feel um, that we're not putting the spotlight enough on them. A lot of other celebrities say like Kanye West get get the attention but we're not putting focus enough attention on our engineers our scientists our mathematics all the people in the technology field um, and we should definitely point them out and get to know them and also there's a dire need in the future there's gonna be a lot of job openings in the field of STEM so that's the very first question the second question is when am I planning on releasing these shows uh, well I plan to release them weekly uh, plan is Tuesday, Tuesday afternoons, Tuesday nights uh, on the Pacific Coast. Um, and then I guess the third question is where can I reach you? Well, um, I have set up an email at tonightinstem at gmail.com. So if you have any questions, maybe any questions for future professionals, maybe you're going through an interview, maybe you're thinking between two majors, maybe we can ask that question to the professionals um, that I interview. So again, tonightinstem uh, at gmail.com. So let's get right to it, Max. Uh, so you are a computer engineer? Yes. Computer engineer. Okay, so tell us, uh, first of all, okay, so a little bit about what a computer engineering does. Because I'm a computer scientist. I know when I started in high school, I didn't know the difference between what's a computer engineer, what's a computer scientist. Can you explain that? Well, I guess it depends on where you work. Uh, computer engineer, when you study computer engineering, uh, you study a little bit of electrical engineering and some computer science. Okay. And then you do embedded systems, uh, which is kind of like computer science, but lower level. Okay, so doing a lot of circuits? Uh, not necessarily. Again, it depends on where you work. Okay. If, if you work at somewhere where they're having you design circuits, you have, you know, you got some education in that uh, when you got you were getting your degree. So if they need you for that, you're more than capable of doing that. If they need you to do some programming, you can do some programming, C, C++, Java, whatever is required, um, VHDL, um, Verilog, if you need to do okay. any embedded system stuff. Uh, again, And then a computer scientist, how does that compare? A uh, computer scientist is mostly just programming. Um, okay. They can get into hardware, but I, I think uh, it's a little more difficult for somebody in software to go over to hardware than it is for somebody in hardware to go to software. Okay. Just because when we go to school, it, I mean, that's one of the first things you learn is how to program. Okay. Okay. So I guess like programming is a, is a base for all engineering, uh, even well, electrical. Now it's pretty much, yeah, now it's pretty much a requirement. You know, you use it so much. And if you can program, it just automates things that makes things a lot easier and saves you a lot of time. Okay. Okay. So how did you get into computer engineering? Um, I know you were in the Marine Corps. Did it happen then? Was it before as a child? Were you interested? Were you the kind of person that not broke like alarm clocks like I did, but like got took them apart, were interested in how the internals worked? How did you get interested in this, this these I fields? Was, I was always interested in computers. Okay. Um, you know, since I was very young. What was your and, very first computer? Uh, it was a, I think it was a compact <laughs> that, um, yeah, I, I bugged my dad for like a while. You know, I think it was my junior year in high okay. school, or yeah, junior year in high school that I ended up getting getting a computer. But before that, I had taken some like little summer classes for students where they had us put a computer together. So I was already learning okay different things about the components okay. of the computer and you know use learning how to type. Okay, uh, I took try I tried to take a lot of computer classes at my high school. What high school did you go many. to? Uh, San Marcos High School. Okay, San Marcos. So that's in Santa Barbara, correct? Yes, Santa Barbara. Okay, okay. awesome. So you're local to the Santa Barbara area. Yes. Um, and then what kind of 
made you make that transition to the Marine Corps? Was it right away out of high school? Yeah, I went right after high school. Okay. Um, I was in for four years, um, and you know, I enjoyed it. It was great, but got you know, to travel a lot. Travel, got to travel a lot. Got to see a, you know, a lot of interesting things. Um, but I felt that I could, you know, I always had that passion for you know computers and learning more about computers, how they work, uh, electronically, okay, and you know, software wise. Um, so when it came down to for my extension, I was in Iraq and you know I did not want to be over there anymore. So I kind of had to think about what I was going to do, and I thought that education was the the best route to to take and go and pursue computers. Okay, so it wasn't so it didn't happen right away. You had to take some time. I guess did the Marine Corps kind of um, expose you to that? No, not at all. Okay. I was fixing the weapons in the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, I was with the uh, first light armor reconnaissance battalion. Okay. Uh, at a Camp Pendleton. Um, but no, I okay. I didn't have any exposure to computers. Uh, <laughs> so why didn't you go things. straight into a four year university or uh, two year like a city college, community college? Uh, you know what? I I don't think I had the. Um, I did. I didn't really see city college as an option for me. I'm not okay. sure why. Um, you know, I, I was good at math when I was in elementary and okay. junior high, and then I had started ha having issues with school and things like that. And I think I started to lose my motivation for uh, education. Okay. Not not quite computers because I always, you know, enjoyed wanting Enjoy them. Wanted to, but when it came to just going to class and things like that, I, you know, I didn't really have a, a, a passion for it until, you know, I got into the Marines and I was like, you know what, I got to do something with my life. So I got to think okay. about my future and that, that, pursue what I that want. That point came in. We had to choose what to do with your life. Yeah. Okay. So I know you mentioned math. Um, I know in our last episode when we interviewed Luis Garfias, he also said kind of math was a point like, oh, I'm good at math. Let's go into engineering. Why did you make that connection? Why, I, I why math? I made that connection at first. Actually, <laughs> so, um, I was good at math, and then I started having trouble in school. And, you yeah. know, I, I didn't even take calculus in high school. Okay. So I... I really slacked off when I when I transferred over to high school with my science and math. Okay, so after the Marine Corps, uh, did you go to four university, two year? I went to uh, Santa Barbara City College. And so I got out August 7th, 2004. Okay. From the Marine Corps and my classes started, what was it, August 23rd or something like that. So a few months before I got out, you know, I was already getting books and started studying for the entrance exams so they could see where I was going to be placed for math. Okay. Yeah, I remember those. Actually, I went to City College, all Santa Barbara City College. I remember getting, placing those exams. Um, and then what, so at what point did you know you wanted to do computer junior specifically? Uh, I didn't know at first. At first, I thought I was going to do computer science. Okay. So I was thinking Should have done computer science. I'm a computer science. It's their best, best major. Sure. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I was doing computer science and then I had to take physics and we were taking, we were doing optics and we were doing mechanics and I kind of liked doing that type of math and trying to solve those problems. And when I got to, um, electromagnetism, I, you know, I really enjoyed that class. When I took my circuits class, I enjoyed that as well. And I was like, oh, you know what? I really want to do this. I want to design circuits. I want to, you know, do some hardware and, as I kept learning more and more, you know, I found out that there's a major where you can do just that. You can do the computer science, you can do your programming, and you can do some some electronics work as well. That, that's awesome. So how did you keep yourself motivated through City College? So I know for me, it was really hard to keep motivated. Um, it was these very challenging classes, math, uh, doing calculus, multivariable calculus, physics, all the physics sequences. How do you keep yourself motivated? Uh, I think what it you know, what it comes down to is for me, anyways. It was a lot of it had to do with my parents. Okay. Um. So my parents came here from Mexico, and you know they made a lot of sacrifices for myself and my brothers. So you know, for me, my something that my dad always wanted for us was for us to get an education, and I think that was a major part of it. Uh, the other part that helped me stay motivated throughout the whole thing was uh, just having friends that were doing the same thing that I was doing. You know. The friends that I made at City College, they were all doing engineering, and they were all really motivated to, to study and you know transfer to Foya University and get our degree. So we kind of kept each other motivated, helped each other out. So I think that was a you know really big help for me. So you had a 
a, a support group up here support yeah. group that kind of helped and all those uh, long nights and, and at city college there i mean the staff there the instructors the professors you know the deans there everybody's so supportive there it was for me it was a, a very good growing experience and you know education was different for me then than it was when i was in high school so i think that it was different out. okay so um i know you did a couple internships um while you were at city college um I guess one in specifically is your uh, inset uh, internship. Can you talk about this? I have a, a picture of you. I found you on online from 2007, me. right? I, I don't. I don't remember much. About <laughs> what I do? I was doing. Um, I was doing some tests. So high speed characterization of photonic integrated circuits. Yep. So Matt was a PhD student. And he was doing some work with photonics and some really cool stuff. And what I had to do is I had to, I was using some of the instrumentation in, in the lab to test out his equipment. So I had to write some programs using MATLAB. I think it was MATLAB. I can't remember. Uh, MATLAB or C Sharp. Uh, it was C Sharp. Okay. Uh, to Visual Basic there. Software written in Visual Basic. Yeah, Visual Basic. Yeah, there but I go. remember doing some C Sharp as well. Okay. So hey, as an engineer, you were using multiple languages. Yeah, yeah. So once you learn one, you know, once you know the syntax and you know, you know the basics of coding, it's just learning the syntax for the other um, languages, okay. you know. So it's not too difficult to learn. And so the thing is, if you don't use it, you're going to forget. So, you know, ask me to do Visual Basic now. I can pick it up pretty quickly, but I'm not going to be able to write it. So you have the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, so this was one of your internships. Um, I actually have your also your your PowerPoint that you presented, yeah. um, how does this, how did this internship help you, uh, maybe kind of enforce what you were doing? Um, how did that help? Uh, it, it helped quite a bit, you know, cause it, for me, I found things like this really interesting and, you know, kind of just using the equipment no, there and we go. seeing what people were doing with math and science was, you know, really interesting and the different applications that something like this would have is, you know, you're making a, a big impact in, in many ways. Correct. Even it, though it's, you know, it takes, you know, years for a technology like this to actually develop to go out to the consumer market or somewhere where it can be used. But once it's out there, it's making a huge impact. Okay. So that's, that's, and so what does the INSET stand for? Um, can people apply to, to be part of this INSET program? INSET stands for Internship in Nanos. Internship nanosystems. I'm trying to find it here. So I always have a hard time too. Yeah, I can't remember. That was what? Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Yeah. 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 All right. This yeah. is awesome. Um, so this is one of your internships. I know I was on your LinkedIn. Uh, you had other internships. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and also an intern in Chile. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So what was? How was that? That was a lot of fun. Um, Got to uh, go to Chile for one for a few months, a uh, couple months. And that was a lot of fun. I was doing MATLAB um, work over there. Um, okay. So, yeah, it was definitely a different experience. And getting to see how, you know, a lab works in another country compared to here in the United States. And, you know, at first I thought I was going to get my, my PhD when I was going to, to school. And... You know, I think some of some of these internships kind of fueled my passion to keep learning more and, and get my degree. But at the same time, I was kind of realizing that maybe I don't want to do my PhD and and uh, the grad student life was, was not. <laughs> so um, you did all these internships. Um, so I guess this helped you kind of see that you didn't want to do your PhD. You were you were going directly into industry, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so and I know you currently work at True Vision Systems. Um, let's jump ahead. And so uh, first of all, I guess we should say you graduated from UCSB, uh, University of Santa Barbara, California, as a computer engineer. Um, and how did you get your first job at True Vision? Because that was your first job, correct? First, yeah, I guess full time. Yeah, that's my first my first uh, STEM job out of uh, with my uh, my undergrad degree. Okay. So actually, I was doing the technology management program at UCSB. Okay. And my one of my partners that we did our capstone with, uh, he, we were going to do a competition. Actually, we did a competition 
we took our capstone project and we put it into this um, venture competition where you, you pitch your idea, you have your little prototype, and you pitch it to VCs and try to get uh, funding to actually start a company and you know see if see where it goes from there. So we made it pretty far. Uh, we made it to the to the finals. We were the you know made it to the last five groups where we had to give you know these presentations to like real uh, venture capitalists okay. that are you know. And what was your idea questions. pitching? If uh, if we know yeah. this, so, this yeah, innovative our, idea, our idea was uh, called uh, Differ. Okay. Um, and what it was was RFID technology okay. used with a touchscreen, and it was when you s- scan the the RFID, you would put up clothing items, kind of like. Um, so we would. The main purpose of this was to go into a, a dressing room. So when somebody would walk into a dressing room, the RFID tag would already be on the clothing item. Okay. The scanner would scan it. When you walk in, you wouldn't have to do anything. It just scan it. It will show you what you have on the screen. Okay. Show you the sizes. And then say you put putting stuff on and something doesn't fit you, you can check right away. You know, it doesn't fit me. And it will tell you right away if they have other sizes. You know, oh, okay. You can find it. So, um, so you would see bottom, yourself, yeah, like no, on you display. Can't see yourself. Okay. No, we don't want to put. Uh, <laughs> but that's it true. That's true. The clothing item uh, that you had on the screen, and on the bottom, it would also show you other clothing items that would go with what. So, say you're wearing a shirt, it would, uh-huh. you know, suggest a tie and a belt, or maybe some pants or some shoes that would go along with that. Huh, that's and awesome. We actually got it working, and we we ended up getting a capstone project of the year for. Oh, congratulations! For that year, and uh, so, and we made it to the the finals for a venture uh, uh, competition. But back to your your original question was, uh, my friend Sal Vasquez, um, he was working at True Vision at the time, and he told me that I should go in there and give a presentation, or at least go over my business plan with uh, Bern Trabathi, uh, who's the the VP of Engineering. Um, at the time, that's that was his position, and he, you know, I gave him the the spiel, and uh, he gave me feedback. Uh, it was all very good feedback, and helped us out a lot. And Bernie gave me his business card. He's like, yeah, if you want a, a job when when you're done getting your, your bachelor's, uh, you know, give me a call. We can. We can so that's the, the entry point. Spot for you. Yep. That's it. Okay. And so. So um, I ha- I'm bringing up the True Vision website here. Um, so we've got True Vision. So True Vision is a 3D medical device company. Yep. Can you explain a little bit about what they do? Um, I guess we should warn people ahead of time. Um, there might be some images. There might be a little bit sur- surgical images. that be a little gory. Um, so just ahead of time. Uh, but yeah, can you explain to us what True Vision does? Yes, we make uh, 3D visualization guidance. So yes, you can see on the... Where the doctors are at on the last screen they were, they were huddled around a microscope um, and if you notice there's the oculars on top right on the microscope oh, okay these so, yeah so what we make a 3d camera that goes on the side port or it can... replaces the oculars that's the that's our old uh, camera okay um, and the, the camera actually has two sensors in there we have two optical paths so that we can get a 3D image, same as, you know, you have two eyes and your brain puts the two images together to give you a sense of depth. So we're doing the same thing with that camera. Um, the hardware is just a small part of what the company does. Uh, we do a lot of software. So if you notice, there's uh, the software on the screen. We okay. do uh, guidance for ophthalmology. So you have so, another picture here. Yeah. Actually, I can show probably the, the, the videos, right? So, this so is... you can actually see what, you know, we actually get the image, we do overlays over the image. So okay. Is this talk. in real time? Yeah, this is all real time. Okay. Yeah, the doctor needs real time. They they are very sensitive to any type of latency. Okay. Because it will affect their movements. So this is actually, you're overlaying uh, this these measurements over the eye in real time. Yes, and it's actually tracking the eye. If you see the eye movement, oh, okay, that's awesome. it actually moves with the eye. And this is old, very old software, so okay. uh, newer ones much, it's much better than 
much better now. Yeah. Okay. So what's so what's your position? What's your uh, kind of contribution to to True Vision? Uh, my current position now is a manager of hardware engineering. Um, I did a lot of work on our current uh, camera. It uh, uses USB 3.0 to transmit uh, all the, the images. We do 1080p, 60 each eye. Um, That's a lot of bits. Over. Yeah, that is a lot of bits. It's a lot of data. It's, and uh, especially real time. Yeah, it's uh, 370 uh, megabytes per second. Okay. Close to 400. Um, we're pushing it. Um, so I, I did a lot of work on the firmware for that. Did you know helped out with the schematic design on that as well. Um, lots. Of, I'm working on another project now that's you know it's uh, pretty interesting. It's, uh, can't talk about it. <laughs> I was gonna say, are you gonna give us a little a little insight in the future of True Vision here? <laughs> uh, where it's definitely gonna be changing. Um, okay. The the surgical environment. So I was uh, actually. Service, yeah. Yeah, so I was looking, actually looking at your, let me see if I can find the video. Um, it talks about how it's beneficial for the surgeons. Um, and I'll get to a point where, so are you guys integrate everything into the cloud? Having everything connected? Can you explain a little bit about this? Yeah, we're, we're working on that. Um, it's still kind of, you know, difficult because some hospitals don't have Wi-Fi access and you okay, know, so this needs Wi-Fi access. access the server. So yeah, this is all actually very new. That okay, we're still currently developing this, and you know, it's, it's very cool stuff. And it's it's going the, the stuff that you're seeing now. This is like a little video, mainly focused for ophthalmology, okay, um, eye surgery, and things like that. So so you have ophthalmology, and then I also saw you have a neuro neurosurgery, correct? Yeah, there's some neurosurgery. Okay, so then can you explain? So this is also in 3D. So you're displaying uh, DICOM data and other data in 3D. Correct. Yep. So how is that beneficial to the the doctor? Well, currently they have two separate screens. They have screen for you know actually now they most of them use the oculars. So they're just looking through the microscope through the optics down, and then they have to you know look at another screen to look at the DICOM data, or you know have it printed out so they can see where they're at, they'll do scans oh, okay. while they're doing the surgery. Um, but this way, we can take that, that data, overlay it over the 3D image, and now they, they have everything on one screen. So now okay. they don't have to be looking back and forth, and it's just it's much better for the, for the surgeon. So you mentioned um, they're looking through the oculars. Um, are they always kind of like hunching down, looking down? And then how does 3D enhance that? Uh, they're not hunched over, but it, it depends on the surgeon and how he, he does his, his surgeries. But definitely, surgeons have a lot of back problems. Um, and with this system, we are helping with ergonomics. Now they can sit up straight, look at the screen, um, and help, you know, help them work longer because they're not having back issues, you know, later on in their life. They can actually keep working because um, they can go into an eight-hour surgery, for example. And, and do the whole thing without any and know they'll do it right and correctly because their their back's not hurting yeah. of course this is awesome so okay so traditionally they would so let me put this up right now um so traditionally they would take pre-op pictures um and then they would they have to carry those over into this the, the surgery room um how does that improve with with this true vision system this 3d technology uh, so the pre-op data that just kind of gives the the, doc, the surgeon you know information data on what kind of lens he's going to use to to correct the eye and, and things like that and that all gets transferred over to our system so that our all our internal calculators that our software team has worked on uh -huh. it calculates the best locations for them to do their incision and what type of lens should be used to give. The patient the best outcome okay uh, yeah i'm still amazed by uh the real time this is 3d um so what kind of 3d technology do you guys have do you guys use active or passive we use uh passive um 3d technology okay uh, just because with active you have you know glasses that are actively 
blocking out light, you know, with one eye, then the other, then the other. So you, your glasses need batteries, and you do get better resolution that way. But there tends to be ghosting where you can kind of see the left image over the right or okay. the right over the left when you're only supposed to see one. Uh, the other problem is the battery could die out, and then you can yeah, you don't want that in an eight-hour surgery. Um, the other thing, so some of the benefits of passive is their glasses are lightweight. They're you know not very expensive. Uh, they're more comfortable. You don't have to worry about the battery dying out. Uh, and now with the 4K technology coming out, you have more pixels, so now you can have more resolution per okay. each eye. Um, so huh. yeah, passive is is the way to go. Uh, that's that's awesome. Um, so I guess, uh, what are your future plans? You plan to stay in this, the medical device, the 3D industry? It seems like, uh, you're kind of at the forefront of this, um, cause we've, we've seen all probably 3D in the movie theaters. We've seen it, the lucky ones that have it on their TV, but to apply this in the medical device industry, you're kind of new in the forefront here. I guess you're an expert now. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Uh, my plans are to, <laughs> I, I, you know what, I, I really... When I when I graduated, I didn't really know what field I wanted to pursue. Um, I know I, I knew I wanted to be doing something with electronics, and for me, I think True Vision has really grown into being a perfect fit for me, where I can do software, I can do hardware, and you know, it's it's always something different. You know, it's always something different. So now I you know you go from the development phase. To the production phase and now to the supporting phase where you can support the product you can you know help the qa team you can help people on the field troubleshoot so you know i it's not boring it's not i'm doing i'm not doing the same thing every day for months on end you know i have little phases right now so that's it's it's, it's been so far it's been great so i guess i i want to reinforce that because yeah also personally um uh, Another reason I joined the whole the whole STEM field, um, engineering is always changing. There's always new technology. As you see, this is 3D. We didn't have 3D, what, like 10 years ago? Uh, or we did it with that little... Yeah, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> it wasn't very good, right? So this technology is always changing, advancing, and it never gets old. So you never stop learning. Um, and even if it's... Now we have a VR. I think 3D has led into the whole VR scene, well, virtual reality or AR. Um, augmented reality so we're seeing these transition technologies moving fast so I'm really interested to see where this 3d takes us um, so I guess with that said um, I guess Max do you want to add anything else before we dive into I guess tip trip or hack or even a little tutorial of, of the week uh, no, not, not much I can okay. say other than uh, you know I, I think what you're doing is great you're you know, <laughs> doing doing some good things and starting yep, thank you. tonight in STEM is, you know, it, you know, it takes, takes your time, it takes your energy and, and you're going with, with what you think uh, needs to be done. And Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I have my very first testimonial. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, I guess actually, before we go, I know we want to touch this. So, um, let me put touch on this. So you were saying, uh, before we started that, um, people can go home um, and actually see this in 3D, is that correct? Yeah, so right now what you're seeing is a side-by-side -side image. Okay. Um, if you have a 3D TV at home, you should be able to watch this in 3D by just okay. setting your, uh, your... Proper TV settings set. and stereoscopic, yeah, right? Yeah, set it to side-by-side. -side. Um, the other thing that you could do that I haven't tried yet, yes, you can use the, the Google Cardboard uh, to play the YouTube video from your phone inside the Google Cardboard and says you get in the left and right images, so you just gotta, I think there's a way to do that, to play the those videos through YouTube, and you should be okay. able to, to get a pretty good 3D image through the, through the Google Cardboard. Okay, that's, it's that's little, awesome. It's gonna be a little pixelated, but... Yeah, cause the again, the resolution you're talking depends about. Depends on your phone, so if you have a really high res phone, it, it's gonna look better. Okay, so for the people that don't know um, what I'm holding up, is this is uh, Google Cardboard. Google Cardboard was released, I guess, two years ago now? Or is it one year ago? Uh, but one year ago. Yeah, I think it was a year ago. Um, and basically, what you can do is, you can order these. These are very cheap, like $20, maybe. Yeah, I average in $20. And you build it. I built this, put a little tape in there. And you put your phone in here. 
uh, like that and then just close it up as I get the case out but and then you just look in play uh, some content in there a 3d content like Max is saying you can try that his video out and then see what comes out the other end and it's actually pretty amazing uh, what this this is really cheap like 20 bucks you're not spending six hundred dollars on oculus rift okay awesome so um max was going to give us a little tutorial on how 3d worked um i guess specifically passive 3d yeah i can do that um so passive 3d works with having a polarizing a layer uh, over the tv and so a tv will have a lot of pixels you have 1920 in the horizontal and 1080 in the vertical if you have a 1080p display so that's um, hence the 1080p yeah, and you have four okay. times that much in a 4K display, okay. which is why you get the better resolution. Um, and what they do with the polarizing lens that goes over that TV is they actually polarize each row of the TV. Huh, so okay. the, the top one is polarized so that your left eye can see it, the second one so that the right eye can see it, and it just alternates all the way down so that when you weigh in the polarizing lens, it's polarized this way, for your, say your left eye, and you're only going to see the stuff on the screen that's not polarized in the opposite direction. Okay. And that's how you're able to, to see you know some one image for your left and one image for your right. So if these these images come uh, to you, I guess are a little bit shifted, correct? And then because there's two images, yeah. your eye puts them together so, yeah, and the, thinks it's 3D. So, yeah, when they're the, when they're you know the more disparity, the more I guess I would say the more depth that there is to it, okay. but there's there's also too much where if it's too far apart, it's you know it's not going to look right. It's like having your finger too close to your nose uh, okay. where you start seeing double. So there's a you know there's that, there's that, a happy medium there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess we've seen this when we go to the movie theaters and we have um, these movies where they have like things popping right in front of yeah. us. So they they separate yeah. the images to a certain point where it's actually in front of us. Okay. Awesome. Um, so my tip of well i guess max are you anything else you'd like to add to the whole 3d um i think i think it's cool <laughs> it's um i mean yeah I, I i enjoy it i think it's uh i don't think the technology was quite there when they started selling the 3d tvs and making a big marketing move for it and the public didn't really catch on didn't like it very much so it kind of died out but trust me once 4k you know becomes another another common name another common product they're going to try to come out with 3d again um 3d uh, and 4K see it to believe displays it. look look much way better than than what they did before okay, okay. and Home i can actually content. vouch for that yeah um when you had 1080p you cut the resolution in half um and then with 4k so, so yeah. that means you're going to have 2K on each side, correct? So yeah, with 1080p, you're getting 540 in the left, or 540 rows in the left eye, okay. 540 rows in the right, because you're splitting the 1080 in half okay. per eye. So now with 4K, that's 1080 to the left, 1080 to the right. So you're getting that full 1080 columns or rows. Rows, yeah. Plus the, what is it, 30, 3890, 30, yeah, 3890 okay. pixels uh, horizontal. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Max, for, for explaining 3D. Um, I guess my my tip trick, what is it? I guess a little tip, a little professional tip. Um, I guess this is one of my uh, valuable tips um, that I will share with you guys. I actually learned about this. It was shared to me at a SHIP National Conference Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers Conference. I believe it was in Anaheim. Um, I remember hearing this and the guy was uh, talking about how to stay in contact with with professionals such as Max um, and is to basically save their business cards. So you would meet a professional, you save their business cards. And I talked about that last episode, but save your business cards. And then every Christmas to kind of stay in touch, to kind of um, say, hey, I'm here, I still exist kind of thing. Hey, remember me? Uh, send them send them a Christmas card. Um, I actually have done this for the past maybe two, three, three years. Always I have a list of names 
um, and I ask for their mailing addresses, and I send them Christmas cards because nobody does it. It's the 21st century. Everyone kind of texts is like the instantaneous kind of, uh, I guess, reply. But no, I just send them in a business card saying, hey, thank you. I met you at this place. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing you. Um, and then that's a good way to kind of keep in touch with the professionals once a year. It's just once a year. Go ahead and do that. Um, if you guys might want my P.O. box, I can give it to you guys. But um, <laughs> I guess I, uh, my, my cards got lost in the mail then, huh? Hey, I, I think so. Hey. <laughs> no, with that said, um, I really want to thank everybody for listening to Night in STEM. Uh, you can follow us. Please subscribe, first of all, to YouTube. That's where I'll be posting every Tuesday these videos. Uh, what else? And follow us, yes, on uh, Instagram. I have something. And on Facebook. Just search up Tonight in STEM. So thank you everybody for listening to us. Uh, Max, thank you. Uh, I'll see everybody next week.